Well, hey, this is John, and there has been a lot of discussion about what do we do now regarding the Mandela effect, and the answer always seems to be, well, we're going to have to hear from God, because the Bible's changing, and that's undermining our confidence in Scripture, so I thought, um, Lord, we really need to hear from you about hearing from you, so... <laughs> I hope this helps some folks kind of clarify some things. I know God's been speaking to me about how to press in and just clear out all the things that would hinder me from hearing from him. And I think I'm a lot like other people. These supernatural changes are really have been a sobering wake up call. And it's telling a lot of us that we need to get our houses in order and fill our lamps with oil and prepare for the judgments that are being released upon the world. It just seems so obvious we're in the closing moments of the final days, the final end of the church age. And, you know, those that see the changes in a lot of cases, almost universally, have been pushed out of most relationships and social comforts. They find themselves drifting in a world that is just more foreign than ever. And as friends and family and all the comforts that you've had and the scriptures are removed, a lot of believers are being forced to seek comfort in just God. I've almost noticed, too, that a lot of things are just unenjoyable. Vegging in front of the TV. I just get um, uh, dissatisfied with technology, entertainment. There's nothing else that I want except the secret place. The sufficiency of Christ alone, Jesus is enough. So this barrenness that God is orchestrating will, I believe for many, turn out to be the greatest thing that has happened to our walk with God in a long time, maybe ever. And so there is a principle in nature and in the kingdom of heaven that is really recognized and acknowledged by everyone, but I think it's undervalued and it's misunderstood. That is the less that you have something, the more enjoyable it is when you have it. So for instance, if you've ever gone on a fast, then you'll remember the first bites of food when you begin to eat again. It's amazing how delicious even the simplest little thing like a pretzel or a piece of broccoli or some orange, you put this in your mouth and it's just like, whoa, it's surprising how it's bursting with flavor. Your taste buds are somehow made alive and more capable of tasting all the subtle nuances of the thing you're eating. It's just undeniable. So there seems to be a direct correlation between scarcity and our uh, enjoyment or appreciation of things. I mean, if you've not eaten in three days and it's time to break your fast, you bow your head in prayer to return, return thanks. I can assure you it's not going to be like some fleshly prayer out of obligation, right? You're going you're gonna to be like, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, God, for this taco or whatever. I don't break a fast with a taco, but I think you know what I mean. Thankfulness will be gushing from your soul to God for the food. And you'll appreciate it more than words can describe because it was taken from you. The condition that scarcity produces in a person is desperation and appreciation and heightened enjoyment. And so in some ways, the removal of God's word by the supernatural Bible changes can cultivate a similar response in the believer. Our need for God can become awakened as we sense God withdrawing from us in this way. And we become alarmed and desperate and, and an urgency rises up that maybe wasn't there before. Our complacency is disrupted and we begin to push aside technology, vain pursuits, and anything that will cool our affection for him. We finally are sensing the coming judgment that we've all been talking about and we decide now to ruthlessly deal with the bosom sins that we have made excuses about for many years. So the Mandela effect, the supernatural Bible changes specifically, 
can produce a purifying effect upon our souls if we allow it. And then our hearts can burn again with passion for Jesus. God has sent a famine of the word. And this famine has created scarcity in our Christian experience. And this, in turn, is cultivating a new appreciation for God in many people. Because I'm talking to you, and that's what you're saying, and I'm experiencing it myself. We're becoming more respectful of what displeases God, even in little things. And we're choosing to make more time for him and prioritize our life around the prayer closet. As scriptures become more and more difficult to read, we become more and more aware of how depraved we have been and how insolent we have been and how spiritually dull we are. And we're being stirred to action to fix the hellish conditions within our souls. And we're experiencing a spiritual awakening, a revival, a renewal of passion for Jesus. It's glorious. And the centerpiece of this pressing in is going to be accompanied by a new ability to hear the voice of God with clarity, a new understanding of what it is to know when God is speaking to you with certainty, no doubting, no second guessing, no asking for confirmations. There's a refinement that's taking place in our discernment to be able to detect the difference between what's God's voice What's my mind speaking? What's my flesh speaking? Or even who, the, the voice of the enemy. And I believe for many it's going to become common to hear from God on a daily basis in what's before us. And when people talk about hearing from God, sometimes people think that's arrogant and prideful to suggest that you might hear from God at all, much less on a daily basis. But it's actually the opposite. It is pride that actually suggests that someone that claims to hear the voice of God is some like schizophrenic. Oh, you hear voices? Or they're, you know, accused of lying to sound more spiritual. But that's just pride saying that because they're setting themselves against the clear testimony of Scripture. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. This is not a parable or allegory. Jesus means that if you walk with him, he's going to speak to you, and you'll hear him speaking to you on the inside. It's not like a voice from heaven, like when God spoke to Jesus and everybody around him heard it. This is on the inside, but it's very clear. It's very knowable. And so you get this kind of sarcastic sniping that people have about it. And uh, it's just people's attempt to cover up their own, you know, lack of hearing from God. But that's understandable. But a lot of people's denominations have taught them, well, that's not our way. You know, Holy Ghost things, power of God, relationship with God. They're, they're, it's a dead, dry religion. So it's not their way to think that you can actually hear from God. But they didn't learn that from the Bible, that God is mute and he doesn't speak to his children. That's just a tradition of men. Because from Genesis to Revelation, really the centerpiece hallmark of the believer is they were very definitely hearing from God. Hearing the voice of God is one of the most, if not the most, important indications that you're right with him. God does not typically reveal himself to the casual observer. I mean, he does draw sinners. He tapped me on the shoulder before I was saved. But generally, God must be sought in order to walk with him. And if you do, I've found God to be a, a veritable chatterbox. If that's what you desire from him, I do believe we hear from God in a direct proportion to how much we want to hear from God. So, of course, this is completely <laughs> subject to the sovereignty of God. Man cannot make God do anything, but it is God who pursues us from the beginning. And so it's perfectly fitting for God to be wanting to communicate with us. We see this in 2 Chronicles 16.9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So God is chasing us down. He wants to talk to us. 
And I'm not saying God doesn't speak to sinners, because he does, but this does not seem to take place on a regular basis. The child of God, however, is clearly invited to an intimate relationship with God on a regular basis. So you see this in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Well, I don't know about you, but I need God moment to moment. I need God every day. So what this is telling me is not only can I get access to God's throne like my child can come into my room or come into my presence. They don't have to crawl in and be beggarly. They know they can come to their dad. And they can do it whenever they need him. That's our God. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 16 tells us you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. In other words, like Adam and Eve behind the, the bushes, gar, you know, cowering from God. God doesn't listen to me. That's not God that put that in your mind. But you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Daddy, it's a loving term of endearment, Abba Father. It's intimacy. That's the spirit that you've received. And so the best way I think I can clarify, you know, this idea of how do I hear from God? How do I know it's his voice is to share an experience that I had a while back. And then once I share the story, I'll try to pull out some thoughts from it and hopefully give folks some practical steps if they'd like to, you know, how can I hear from God, you know, more effectively? So. This was going back about five years. I went into uh, looking at getting out of the U.S. I actually traveled to Uruguay. I was down there spying out the land, possibly move my family um, there so we could avoid the tyranny that was coming. And I went down with an expat group and spent about a week traveling around, seeing the different options, trying to determine if it was feasible. And when I came back, I ent entered into a, uh, a season of prayer, and it lasted about two weeks, and it was very intense. Every morning, I would get up at 5 a.m., and I would walk out the door, and I'd go through this neighborhood up into this area that was under development. So it was a, a neighborhood, but the, all the houses were half built. So there's no one up there. And it would all in all take about two hours. So... I was in intense, focused prayer for two hours a day for two weeks in a row. And during this time, there was only one thing that I was praying about. God, should I go to Uruguay? That's it. Nothing else. And just as an aside, on, on uh, one Saturday morning during this period of time, that first week, uh, my family and I were going to garage sales and. um I was at one of these garage sales was on this path that I would walk and I mentioned to this lady uh, that I was considering going to Uruguay to avoid persecution and we had this little discussion at her house and then we you know we went on our way uh, anyway I was determined to really hear the mind of God I didn't want to go if it wasn't God's will so at the end of two weeks I'm walking down the street kind of winding down it was a full moon really bright and suddenly the holy spirit just hit me like oh it overshadowed me and it was so strong i actually bent over and and froze and i was like whoa whoa because i was kind of not praying anymore i was just kind of walking and all of a sudden bam so i'm doubled over in the street and I'm like, whoa. And I remembered um, Eli, and he told Samuel. Samuel was hearing God speak to him, but he didn't know it. And so Eli told him, hey, the next time you hear the voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. <laughs> That's what I did. So I, I'm doubled over, and I say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. And this is what I heard as loud and as clear as you're hearing my voice right now. I've called you to be a worship leader to the body of Christ, and if you leave, you'll miss it. I've called you to be a worship leader to the body of Christ, and if you leave, you'll miss it. Well, 
I knew immediately that was the answer to my prayers for the last two weeks. I'm asking God, should I go to Uruguay? That's all I prayed about. And he basically said, you can, but it won't be my perfect will. But it also meant that God was giving me the choice. And it didn't take me more than about a second to determine my answer. I didn't want to do anything that wasn't the perfect will of God, which meant the answer was no, I'm not going. I mean, what, what difference does it make, right, if I extend my life 30 years and die of old age, but I miss God? Better to live two years and be persecuted and martyred, right, and die in the will of God. Well, you would think that that was the end of it. However, as it turned out, it wasn't because I really didn't want that to be the answer. It's not the answer I wanted. I wanted to be out of here. And so I proceeded to convince myself, well, maybe that wasn't God after all. Maybe that was just me. Have you ever done that? You ever knew it was God, but you didn't want it to be God, so you decided to say, well, maybe that was just me. Or how do I know that wasn't me? Well, what I did then was I decided to continue to pray for another week, two hours a day at 5 a.m. Except now, my prayer was not, God, do you want me to go to Uruguay? Now my prayer was, God, was that really you? I want a confirmation. I'm going to put out a fleece. I want a second opinion. I want to confirm to make sure that was you, God. I think that was you, but I want to make sure, God. <laughs> I mean, I know you've done it too, so don't look at me like I'm terrible. All right, I, I prayed for this week. And actually, it was terrible because <clears throat> I, I was saying, I want you to tell me that you want me to go. I was basically telling God what I wanted. I'm disregarding what God had just spoken to me, and I'm asking God to tell me what I really wanted to hear. And looking back on it now, it was only the mercy of God that he didn't strike me down for my insolence and my presumption, like what he was going to do to Balaam. Because it was so supernatural how he talked to me. And God sent that angel to Balaam to kill him, but the donkey saw the angel, and he kept lying down. And you can read about that story in Numbers 25. It's really crazy because Balaam starts beating the donkey because it keeps lying down. And then God, it says God opened his mouth, and the donkey and Balaam have this conversation. Back and forth, and it's not. it doesn't indicate that Balaam even acknowledge the fact that all of a sudden the donkey's talking in full sentences. <laughs> anyway, the angel tells tells him, if it wasn't for the donkey, you'd be dead. Anyway, God didn't kill me, but he did give me what I was asking for. I'm asking for a confirmation that you want me to go. So I have basically disregarded what he told me. I'm asking God for a sign. Now I'm saying, if you want me to go, I want you to speak to me audibly. I literally want to hear your voice out loud telling me I should go. I remember praying that way. When I think about it, it's just, it's so embarrassing. It was so disobedient. But, you know, God, God is very long-suffering. He's very merciful, slow to anger. And God was like, okay, if that's what you want, I'm pretty sure I just told you my answer, <laughs> you know? But if that's what you want, so I'm walking back. Now, it's dark. It's 6 a.m. on the road, and it's mostly half-built houses, except for a few houses. And I see this balloon on a mailbox of one of the houses that's occupied. And I thought, well, that's odd, and it's dark. So then I see some lady walking towards me in the dark on this deserted road. I'm like, what is she doing here? Well, it was the lady that I spoke to at the garage sale, and she's helping some kid with their birthday party down the street from her. And I finally see her. I get close enough. I'm like, oh, hi, I remember you from the garage sale. And she goes, oh, yes, you're the gentleman that said that you were going to go to Uruguay to escape the tyranny, and I've been thinking about you, and I've actually been talking about you with some of my friends, and I think you should go to Uruguay. I was like, I fell to my knees right in front of her. I was like, <laughs> she had no idea I'm asking God for like a whole week to hear those words. 
because now I had just heard in my ears audibly that I should go to Uruguay, completely supernaturally. <clears throat> I was totally blown away. But but now I was in more trouble and more conflicted than I was before because I deep down knew in my soul the first time I heard the voice of God, it was God. And basically he told me, don't go. And now I've got a direct supernatural answer to go. And I really couldn't shake the fact that I sort of knew I had made a big mistake. So believe it or not, I started praying for a third week. So my first two weeks was, God, should I go? And God said, don't go, right? And my third week was, God, if that wasn't really you, it was just my thoughts, and you really do want me to go, then I want to hear it audibly in my ears that I should go. Now, because I knew enough from the first time that it was God's voice, and the second time it conflicted with God's voice, in my fourth week, now my prayer was, God, was that really you that spoke to me through the lady that I should go? <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> and I'm looking back, on it seems so unbelievable that God just didn't strike me dead. But I guess he was, you know, having fun with me or whatever. So in the fourth week now, was that you that spoke to me through the lady? I, I'm, it's Wednesday. It was the middle of the week. And I felt like I heard, I was halfway through. I remember turning around, no more need to pray, because I heard God say, don't worry about this anymore. Your answer will come today, which was kind of an odd thing, but it was totally God. That day, later that day, my wife runs into the same lady in the library. We've never met her before. So she's at the library, and she calls me, and she goes, you're not going to believe this, but I just ran into the lady and she was telling me everything. She said, I think you should all go to Uruguay. <laughs> she told my wife that we should go to Uruguay. And God had just told me that day you will have your answer. And I mean, never met the lady before in my life. And now she's popping up everywhere we go telling us we should go to Uruguay. So anyway, God wasn't done yet. He was giving me what I wanted. Because now it's winter time while this is happening. And so we had happened to have booked a little getaway at like Myrtle Beach, three and a half hours away at a resort. And it was off season. So Thursday night we left. Friday morning we went out to walk on the beach. And there was nobody on this beach because it's off season. It's completely empty. It was us and the seagulls, far as you could see in either direction. And as we're walking back towards the hotel, off in the distance, I see a lady walking towards us. She's walking towards us. She's getting closer. And as I look at her, you guessed it. It's the lady from the garage sale. I kid you not. She went down to, <laughs> she went down to Myrtle Beach, and she's on the beach walking towards us. And I fell on my knees again. I'm like, this is so clearly God. He's clearly giving me the supernatural answer I was asking for, but now I'm in a panic. It, it's this whole thing with the ladies in direct contradiction to what he told me the first place, and I knew it. I couldn't shake it. And really, my wife didn't know any of this. She just thought I was praying a lot. <laughs> but now I'm really, really I'm troubled. I'm so vexed because... I know the first time God spoke to me was his voice, and now it's dawning on me that he's dealing with me like he did with Balaam. And I'm really feeling, feeling the fear of God, and that I'm totally missing God. And so what do I do? Yes, I start praying a fifth week. And now and it's 5 a.m., same thing, and t two hours a day. And so um, now my prayer is, okay, God, Remember back in the beginning when you doubled me over and you said, I've called you to be a worship leader to the body of Christ, and if you leave, you'll miss it. Remember that? Was that you that told me not to go? <laughs> oh, I'm not kidding you guys. I actually did this, and it actually happened, and God spared me just so you could avoid being as disobedient as I was having me live to tell you about it. So now, week five, I'm out the door every day at 5 a.m., 
faithful, diligent, two-hour prayer time. One prayer coming out of my mouth. God, was that you that told me not to go? Right? Because he told me, don't go. He said, if you go, you'll miss it. So was that really you, God, that told me not to go? And so by the end of the fifth week, I was walking back on that same road, just this time a little farther down, and the same thing happened to me again. Boom! God hits me with the Holy Ghost bucket of honey. Boom! Just a ton of bricks. And I'm doubled over. I do the exact same thing. I say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. But this time, I hear a scripture verse quoted on the inside. Not the scripture itself, but the chapter and verse. And I didn't have a Bible with me. I didn't have a phone. And as soon as I heard this, I knew what was happening. I knew this was God giving me a scripture reference. And I ran home, and I got the Bible, and I opened it up. And the verse that I heard was 2 Kings 2.18. And look at what 2 Kings 2.18 says. And when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, Did I not say to you, do not go? <laughs> whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, this was the most supernatural communication that I have ever received from God in my entire 40 years of walking with God. This was a direct answer to a direct question from the scriptures. I mean, I didn't know what 2 Kings 2.18, so it was like lingering in my mind where God will bring up a scripture in your memory and use it. No, this was like, you know, Ezekiel 18.7, can you quote that from memory? <laughs> it says, didn't I tell you not to go? So finally, I was able to trust the voice that I heard on the inside. And since that event, I have never doubted when I hear from God. Now, there is a there is a correlation like between how important the decision is and how you know determined you are to make certain. So I'm not saying you shouldn't ask God for confirmations sometimes, but I think you understand God wants us to trust and know his voice. And that experience really cured me from a lot of the second guessing that a lot of us experience we we he, we're hearing god and we just we we don't trust it we don't believe it we question it and worse we don't want it to be true so then we really question it so let me just share a few things that i took away from that experience and hopefully help you avoid uh, some of the mistakes that i made so first of all uh you need to pursue god until so this was a, a very difficult, arduous commitment to get up at 5 a.m. every morning, make my appointment with God. <clears throat> Apart from this type of consecration, I don't think that really a, a many people can expect to experience the type of breakthrough that you're yearning for. There's exceptions. There's conditions that people are under. I understand. I'm not, I'm not trying to put people under condemnation. I'm just telling you, in my life, if I don't really seek the Lord, I don't get very much out of my Christianity. I'm, I'm just going through the motions. I'm not feeling it. I'm not walking in realms of glory and prayerlessness at the same time. It's like zero chance. You can't be a Christian without Christ, and you can't have Christ being formed in you except on the anvil of prayer, on a disciplined life. Go to bed early, get up early. Not five days a week. The devil doesn't take a vacation. There's no shortcuts. I think we've been entertained enough for 10 lifetimes. Why don't you try some dying to self, some separation from the world, some fasting, praying in tongues one hour a day, ask God for the fire of God to baptize you, pray warfare prayers, pray scriptural affirmations, fast movies, phone, video games for just 24 hours. And for the love of heaven, 
Put the phone away. It's an idol, and it's, it's, it's short-circuiting your ability to hear from God. Be deliberate and get serious with God, and he will get serious with you. The best mindset going into this is to know that God answers prayer. He doesn't have favorites. I showed you that in Hebrews 4 and Romans 8. And to know that you will not be denied. You're like Jacob, who says, I won't let go until you bless me. That's what moves mountains. God loves that, man. He really loves it when we pursue him with the mindset, I am going to seek you until. I remember a lot of people telling me, I've tried prayer. It doesn't work. Well, you that was your problem. Trying is an illusion. You don't. To stick your toe into prayer. You get into prayer and you pray and you ask God to help you learn how to pray until and you get hang on to the horns of the altar until you get a hold of God like a dog after T-bone steak and he will answer you. The greatest parable is Luke 18. There, it's the uh, the unjust judge it's called. It's, it's exactly this point. I'll, I'll just quote it for you. Luke uh, 18 there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, right, he's an unjust judge, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me continually, I'll avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. She wore him down because she was persistent. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Okay? So there's a clear biblical directive to you. You get in the prayer closet, and you get in there, and you get in there, and you just rebuke the lies of the devil that God's not hearing you. You quote scriptures. You claim the promises. You ask God for the fire. You ask him to, he knows you. He knows every hair on your head. He sees your struggles. He's going to come to you, but he can't reveal himself to the casual observer. It's not appropriate. If he just popped, just answered your prayer, you'd be puffed up with pride and he would, he would, he would destroy you. Gold is, is valuable because it's costly to mine. Okay, so another thing that I think is an important and helpful takeaway from my, my unbelievable experience is you need to learn from your history with God and trust your intuition after that. So many times God speaks to you, you'll know it because the voice will tell you things that only God could have known. You ever have that? How could only God could have known that? Nobody knew that except God. Or it will somehow be confirmed by outside circumstances. Some, sometimes when God speaks to you, you know it's God because things confirm that it's God. And during those times that you know it was God, you need to take note of the qualities of that voice that was in you. What, it, what was it like? You heard from God. What was it like? How did he approach you? When did he approach you? Under what circumstances? How did the voice come at you? Like, was it out of nowhere? Was it during prayer? Was it, like for me, I had already stopped praying when God came after me. And then used that history to judge each time it happens in the future. Does that make sense? Because this experience taught me to trust my intuition and my conscience. And moving forward, I have never second-guessed that voice again. Oh, you better believe it. I'm never gonna I'm never gonna dare do what I did with God that time. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. I just don't allow that question to come in. It, that it was just me. I'm sorry. I believe God speaks to me. I'm intelligent. God's intelligent. He's very able to communicate with me. I believe it's gonna happen. I'm inclining my ear to hear God's voice. I should expect to hear it. 
Samuel heard God's voice several times, but he wasn't inclining his ear to hear God's voice. Once Eli told him, hey, the next time you hear that voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. Well, then he was easily able to discern that it was God speaking to him. So God's not your enemy. God's not mad at you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He's the one that initiated this whole thing. He said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. He's pursuing you. The eyes of the Lord flash to and fro throughout the earth, seeking someone in whom he may show himself strong. And so when Elijah was in the cave, God showed all the things that were outside of him that may try to mimic God's voice, like the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. But it was only when God spoke through the small, still voice inside that we are taught this is how God speaks to us, the small, still voice on the inside. <laughs> and then it says, and Elijah pulled the cloak over his head, and he was worshiping. Hallelujah! worshiping because he had heard from God. So what I should have done is I should have made up my mind in advance that I was going to obey God when he does speak and so you don't fall into the sin of Balaam or the sin of John like I did because delayed obedience is disobedience. Don't be like I was and try to get God to tell you what you want to hear. He's God. The job's taken. Just settle in your mind. When God speaks to you, you're going to act, and you're going to act immediately. And so the other thing that I really learned was this quality of the voice. And you read about it in Psalms 28. The whole psalm is about the voice of God. It's so powerful. The voice of the Lord is over many waters. Hallelujah! The glory of God thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. So I'm telling you, when God speaks to you, you'll know it. You just got to get set yourself before him enough and quiet your mind enough to where you can hear it. And we come to know the quality of that voice. It's a voice that's full of majesty. And those that incline their ear to this voice will be able to discern the majesty of his voice. It's unlike anything else you will hear. For me, it comes out of nowhere. And so it's, dis it's distinct from my mind thoughts that in, in that sense. You just have to kind of experience that to know what I'm talking about. It's different than the thoughts of my mind. You'll often recognize his voice because it will be in direct answer to what you're praying about. Right? So when I was praying in that fifth week, was that you that told me not to go? And I hear a scripture that says, don't go. I mean, if I, had, if I had doubted that, I think God would have dealt with me severely. Because the closer you get to God, the more severe the judgments are if you disobey. I mean, would there be any reason why I would doubt that? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't get any clearer than that. And when God speaks, it's often one word, but it will mean a whole paragraph. I don't know how he does that. It's fairly amazing. It's like holographic. It's like a data dump, but it's only one word. And, and yet you get this whole sermon out of it in a moment, like your life flashing before your eyes kind of a thing. That's another way I know it's God. And then there's just a cadence and, and, and it's fatherly, it's filled with acceptance, but it's authoritative and judicial. 
and of course, depending on what he has to say, God can bring a, 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 a very, very scary rebuke, or it can be a comforting word. But I think the most compelling evidence that you can rely on to determine if it's God that's speaking with you is that God has a way with words. He knows exactly what you need to hear and when. And he will dazzle you with his wisdom. And by this alone, you can know it's God. I mean, like it's said about Jesus, no man ever spoke like this man. And you read the Bible and you think nobody could have written these words, at least before the changes. And, the God, and so God is like that. He can speak things to you that will be so profoundly perfect that you'll be swept away and you'll know it's him. And there's also a, a component of revelation of him. And this is really huge as well. You know it's God because it's, it's, it's filled with revelation of him and it leaves you speechless because you feel so privileged by the fact that God is speaking to little old you. <laughs> so we hear the passages in Psalms like he makes my feet like hind's feet. Thou shalt, then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord and, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. When you, when you hear from God, it is so life-changing. You can't even believe God is talking to you, and yet you can't deny it. And it's so uplifting because you feel so significant and so loved and so blown away that God would have direct communication with just you. And so when that happens, you're not going to be waffling back and forth and doubting all the time. You're going to know God. You're going to know his voice. And it will be the thing that will sustain you through all the things that are to come. Because nobody knows how to tell you exactly what you need like God does. Nobody can speak one word in one sentence and have it be a whole paragraph like God can. There's no mortal that can provide such kind of an all-encompassing comfort by speaking to you. No matter what words they cobble together. No mortal can bring you to such a euphoric height of bliss because hearing the voice of God causes the child of God to be infused with the significance and the joy they realize that the very God of creation is having a personal correspondence with them. So the psalmist said, who am I that you are mindful of me? <laughs> it takes your breath away. What if God was to tell you, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased? Well, he does, because if you're in Christ, that's to you as well. God loves you the same way he loves Jesus. That just bounces off most of us. But when God does speak to you, even a short little interaction, it causes you to be able to walk through walls. It turns you into a lion. It's, it's like anesthesia for all the ills of this veil of tears that we're born into. It is the sufficiency of Christ where you learn when you hear his voice that Jesus is enough. Not that your troubles go away, but that you have him and he has you. And the intoxicating, liberating effect of having the God of heaven speak directly to you has caused many saints to confess that if they were to be given a chance to avoid the torture or the suffering that they went through, that they wouldn't change a thing. Because it was only in that place of suffering that God spoke to them and they would do nothing to ever undo that most glorious experience. God bless.